great pleasure to talk to you this afternoon, especially with July 4th just around the corner. It seems fitting that we should look at stories about the founding of America. Before doing this, however, I would like to first take you on a small detour. For in order to understand the role of such stories in American culture, it helps to understand the role of such stories in cultures in general, and to see a few examples of how they work elsewhere. After all, it's often quite easy to see in others what is rather difficult to see in ourselves. And so knowing what to look for and having a little practice is useful. Unfortunately, before approaching the role of stories in cultures in general, I would like to take you on yet a further small detour. For in order to understand literature and culture, it is helpful to understand a few aspects of human biology. After all, culture is an integral part of our biological makeup and thus cannot really properly be understood in isolation. My plan of attack, then, is to deal with these topics in the reverse order to which I've just presented them. First, I'll say a few words about human biology and its implications for human culture, including the roles of certain types of stories. Then I will outline a few examples of origin myths from non-American cultures to illustrate my points. Finally, with this background in hand, I'll devote the remainder of my remarks to my main topic on American origin myths. Of course, time will not permit me to allow, allow me to go into tremendous detail on any of these points, but I do hope that I'll be able to suggest to you the broad strokes of a way of looking at, reading, and thinking about certain types of texts that you will be able to refine yourself if and as you see fit. The whole talk will take about an hour, uh, and when it gets to be a little bit after 1 o'clock, I'll pause, uh, and if people have to leave at that point, please feel free to go, and then I'll finish it, and then we'll have uh, questions uh, at the end. When biologists compare human beings with other animal species, one of the most striking things they find is that humans exhibit a relatively high degree of variability in their behavior. Where other animals usually have just one way of doing a certain thing, humans have many. Pick two groups of chimps at random, for example, and by and large, they'll be identical. Their social behaviors, methods of communication, life courses will all be quite similar. Pick two groups of humans at random, however, and there'll be much more diversity. Their social systems, languages, family systems, etc., will all be quite varied. This is especially true if we allow ourselves to pick from historical communities which no longer exist, as well as those currently found. While there may well be certain human universals, there is also certainly a lot of difference between living in classical Athens and contemporary Chicago, for, for instance. From an evolutionary point of view, this variability, or flexibility, or plasticity of human behavior is highly adaptive, because it makes us both highly reactive and highly proactive. Reactively, this flexibility allows us to readily respond to changing circumstances, both natural environmental ones, such as changing climate, for instance, and artificial human-made ones, such as changing technologies. Such reactive flexibility makes us nimble as a species, and thus well-suited to survive and even flourish in a wide variety of circumstances. Like Proteus, then, the sea god who could take on a variety of forms, humans also have taken, do take, and will continue to take a variety of forms. The means by which humans are made so flexible are many, complex, and interrelated. They include such things as our relatively large brains, our relatively prolonged period of immaturity, and a relatively high proportion of what biologists call open genetic programs, which require environmental input for their completion. The net result of all this is that humans are governed much less by pure instinct or nature than other species are. And the flip side of this is that humans depend to a much higher degree on social learning or nurture than other species do. As anthropologist Clifford Geertz puts it, we live in an information gap between what our body tells us and what we have to know in order to function there is a vacuum we must fill ourselves, and we fill it with information or misinformation provided by our culture. Note then that from this point of view, culture is not a luxury with which we could do without if we had to. Or as Geertz puts it, culture is not just an ornament of human existence, but an essential condition for it. Men without culture would not be clever savages. Rather, they would be unworkable monstrosities with very few useful instincts, fewer recognizable sentiments, and no intellect, mental basket cases. 
Geertz concludes, without men, no culture, certainly, but equally and more significantly, without culture, no men. Thus note that our genes and our culture point in opposite directions. While evolution has worked to open us up, make us more plastic, more flexible, capable of more variety, every particular culture works to close us down, make us more specific, more specialized. Or to quote Geertz one last time, one of the most significant facts about us may finally be that we all begin with the natural equipment to live a thousand kind of lives, but end in the end having lived only one. In a very important sense, therefore, none of us is born American or Israelite or Roman any more than we are born speaking English or Hebrew or Latin. Rather, we are born with the opportunity to become American or Israelite or Roman, as the case may be, just as we are born with the opportunity to learn to speak English or Hebrew or Latin. And in both the case of language and personality and behavior more generally, we become what we become by aspiring to models our cultures provide for us. Or to use a different image, we are born like iron filings on a sheet of paper with no particular orientation and become gradually aligned as we are acted on by the magnetic poles of our culture. And if the process is successful, as it usually is, it is as invisible to us as magnetism itself. The bottom line of all this is that we are born incomplete and that the transformation from an incomplete generic babies into complete culturally specific adults depends upon our learning from our surroundings. And so our genes make us seek information outside ourselves, which our cultures happily supply. Thus, genetically, we are natural questioners, while culturally, we are natural answerers. Genetically, we are naturally curious. Culturally, we are naturally expert. This, to answer that beer commercial, is why we ask why, and why, contrary to that commercial, we are rarely short of answers. In particular, we need to know both what we are supposed to be like and what the world is supposed to be like, for our picture of who we are is part and parcel of our picture of the world we live in. In other words, there is an intimate connection between the way we are supposed to behave and our understanding of why things are the way they are. As an example of this, Consider the struggle between the Catholic Church and Galileo over whether the Earth or the Sun was at the center of the universe. The Church, of course, really didn't give a damn, if you'll pardon the expression, about the location of the physical Earth. What it cared about was the location of humanity in the grand scheme of things. Prior to the Church's eventual change of heart, however, these two issues were overlaid because it was simple and natural to see humans as the center of the universe, theologically speaking, if we were also the center of the universe, astronomically speaking. And it was important to the church that we were at the center of God's concerns in order that God should be at the center of our concerns. One of the key ways that culture fills these intertwined information gaps is through the stories that it tells. Indeed, so important are stories that, as Alasdair MacIntyre puts it, man is essentially a storytelling animal. He continues, I can only answer the question, what am I to do, if I can answer the prior question of what story or stories do I find myself a part. We enter human society, that is, with one or more imputed characters, roles into which we have been drafted, and we have to learn what they are in order to be able to understand how others respond to us and how our responses to them are apt to be construed. It is through hearing stories about wicked stepmothers, lost children, good but misguided kings, wolves that suckle twin boys, youngest sons who receive no inheritance but must make their own way in the world, and eldest sons who waste their inheritance on riotous living and go into exile to live with the swine, that children learn or mislearn both what a child and a parent is, what the cast of characters may be in the drama into which they have been born, and what the ways of the world are. Such stories, then, are not luxuries, not mere entertainment or mere history. Or as Geertz might say, such stories are not ornaments of human existence, but rather essential conditions for it. And in words that echo Geertz's, McIntyre concludes, deprive children of stories and you leave them unscripted, anxious stutterers in their actions as in their words. Hence, there is no way to give us an understanding of any society, including our own, except through the stock of stories which constitute its initial dramatic resources. 
It is a set of very special stories, then, that provide much of the magnetic force which invisibly aligns a mass of human magnetic filings into a coherent, coordinated culture. Such stories have what sociologists Berger and Luckman call self-fulfilling potency, because by describing certain social roles and types of behavior, they induce people to act out those very roles and behaviors. Thus, what to outsiders seem to be merely arbitrary and accidental come to, uh, seem to insiders to be unavoidably necessary and predetermined, as anyone who has visited a foreign country for any length of time can attest. One of the key roles into which we are drafted, of course, is that of community member, whether as citizen, subject, or tribesman. And it is the stories that provide community-wide magnetic force that I mean by the term origin myths. By origin, I mean that they are stories about how a people and the world of which that people is a part came to be. By myth, I mean that they are stories that shape the lives of the people who tell and hear them. In other words, they are stories whose telling has a point. Thus note, I am not talking about whether a story is true or false, and thus that I am using the term myth in a way that may be very different from what you're used to. From this point of view, a perfectly true factual history which shapes the lives of people is a myth, while a perfectly false fictional novel which has no impact whatsoever is not. Thus, from this point of view, by the time something gets collected into a volume labeled mythology, such as Edith Hamilton's, for instance, it is really no longer a myth because it no longer has the power to pay excuse me, no longer has the power to shape people's lives. But if you think of what these stories meant to the people who originally owned them, you'll get the sense of myth that I have in mind. Let's turn now to look at some examples of stories that at one time or another were origin myths. I say were origin myths because the stories we are about to look at no longer have the ability to shape people's lives the way they once did, and thus they are no longer myths in the sense I've just described although they are certainly myths in the more conventional Edith Hamiltonian sense. A good place to start is with what we would all recognize as a so-called primitive or traditional origin myth, in this case, one from the Brule Sioux Indians of North America, which I have excerpted from a collection called American Indian Myths and Legends, edited by Richard Erdos and Alfonso Ortiz. Erdos and Ortiz recorded the story in 1969 from a Sioux in South Dakota and entitled it How the Sioux Came to Be and it runs like this. A long time ago, a really long time ago, when the world was still freshly made, Unctahi, the water monster, fought the people and caused a great flood. Well, the waters got higher and higher. Finally, everything was flooded except the hill next to the place where the sacred red pipestone quarry lies today. The people climbed up there to save themselves, but it was no use. The water swept over the hill. Waves tumbled the rocks and pinnacles, smashing them down on the people. Everyone was killed, and all the blood gelled, making one big pool. The blood turned to pipestone and created the, pipestones, the pipestone quarry, the grave of those ancient ones. That's why the pipe made of that red rock is so sacred to us. Its red bowl is the flesh and blood of our ancestors. Its stem is the backbone of those people long dead. The smoke rising from it is their breath. I tell you, that pipe comes alive when used in a ceremony. You can feel the power flowing from it. Unctahi, the big water monster, was also turned to stone. Maybe Tunkashila, the grandfather spirit, punished her for making the flood. Her bones are in the badlands now. Her back forms a long, high ridge, and you can see her vertebrae sticking out in a great row of red and yellow rocks. I have seen them. It scared me when I was on that ridge, for I felt Unctahi. She was moving beneath me, waiting to topple me. Well, when all the people were killed so many generations ago, one girl survived, a beautiful girl. It happened this way. When the water swept over the hill where they tried to seek refuge, a big spotted eagle, Wanbli Galishka, swept down and let her grab hold of his feet. With her hanging on, he flew to the top of a tall tree which stood on the highest stone pinnacle in the Black Hills. That was the eagle's home. It became the only spot not covered with water. If the people had gotten up there, they would have survived. But it was a needle-like rock, as smooth and steep as the skyscrapers you've got now in big cities. That place is sacred. Wombly kept the beautiful girl with him and made her his wife. 
There was a close connection then between people and animals, so he could do it. The eagle's wife became pregnant and bore him twins, a boy and a girl. She was happy and said, Now we will have people again. It is good. The children were born right there on top of that cliff. When the waters finally subsided, Wombly helped the children and their mother down from his rock and put them on the earth, telling them, Be a nation. Become a great nation. The Lakota Ayare. The boy and the girl grew up. He was the only man on earth, she the only woman of childbearing age. They married, they had children. A nation was born. So we are descended from the eagle. We are an eagle nation. That is good, something to be proud of, because the eagle is the wisest of birds. He is the great spirit's messenger. He is a great warrior. That is why we all, always wore the eagle plume and still wear it. We are a great nation. Note that this story has all of the features I described above. First, in one integrated story, it describes how a variety of things came to be, including the Sioux themselves and a number of geographical spots. Second, it describes why these things have the characteristics they do, why the Sioux are wise, warlike, and great, and why the geographical spots are sacred. Third, it links the people and the land in concrete ways. In particular, Note that the top of the stone pinnacle is effectively the center of the Sioux universe because it is the primordial home of the eagle and thus, in some sense, the most Sioux-like place in the world. Fourth, it contains a variety of implicit and explicit message messages on what a Sioux is which serve as models of behavior. A Sioux is wise and a great warrior like an eagle. He feels a certain power when he smokes the pipe and so on. A Sioux who is not this way is a bad Sioux. Finally, note how the story legitimizes Sioux culture. According to this story, everything described actually happened, and thus, thing, excuse me, and thus things must be the way they are today, or rather, then, in the time when this story still functioned as an origin myth. If we move now to cultures more familiar to us, we will immediately recognize some of the same features in a variety of familiar works. First and foremost, perhaps, is the Pentateuch, also known as the Five Books of Moses, or Torah, which in its original use was an origin myth of the ancient Israelite nation. Like the Sioux tale, but on a much grander scale, we have an integrated story, perhaps the integrated story par excellence, which accounts for how things came to be, including the universe, the Israelites themselves, their title to Canaan, and their laws. For example, after describing the creation of the world and a kind of prehistory, Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 to 7, tells how the first proto-Israelite came to be and how he obtained title to Canaan in the following way. Now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and the ones who curse you I will curse, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So Abram went as the Lord had told him. Abram passed through the land to the place of Shechem, to the oak of Morah. At that time the Canaanites were in the land. Then the Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your offspring I will give this land. So he built an altar to the Lord who had appeared to him. Similarly, Exodus chapter 19 verses 1 to 8 tells how the Israelites proper came to have a unique relationship with God. On the, third new moon, excuse me, on the third new moon, after the Israelites had gone out from the land of Egypt, on that very day they came to the wilderness of Sinai. Then Moses went up to God. The Lord called him from the mountain, saying, Thus you shall say to the house of Jacob and tell the Israelites, You have seen what I did to the Egyptians, and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now, therefore, if you obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession out of all the peoples. Indeed, the whole earth is mine, but you shall be for me a priestly kingdom and a holy nation. These are the words that you shall speak to the Israelites. So Moses came, summoned the elders of the people, and set before them all these words that the Lord had commanded him. The people all answered as one, Everything that the Lord has spoken, we will do. Moses reported the words of the people to the Lord. Such stories greatly influenced the ways of the Israelites, from the invasion of Canaan under Joshua until the destruction of Jerusalem by the Romans and the Jewish diaspora. Indeed, 
following a kind of mythical revivalism, they continue to influence the ways of some contemporary Zionists. But what makes the Pentateuch much different from the Sioux tale, and indeed most other origin myths, is that it includes a detailed code of laws, actually the bulk of the text, which we moderns have a tendency to skip over, which explicitly spells out how Israelites were to behave and the penalties for disobedience. And it is this tight linking of origins and behaviors that made this story such an effective cultural magnet, orienting Israelite life for roughly a thousand years. The classical world of Greece and Rome was also filled with easily recognizable origin myths. Hesiod's Theogony and Work in Days, for example, Ovid's Metamorphosis, or even Aeschylus's Oresteia, which tells of the founding of the Athenian polis. Perhaps the work most similar to the Pentateuch and scope and impact, however, is Virgil's Aeneid, which links the founding of Rome with the fall of Troy through the voyage of Aeneas. Here, a single author has intentionally created a tale of a people's past in order to both explain and legitimate its present and to shape its future. Virgil opens his epic with an invocation of the muse this way. Arms and the man I sing, the first who came compelled by fate, an exile out of Troy to Italy and the Lavinian coast, much buffeted on land and on the deep by violence of the gods, through that long rage, that lasting hate of Juno's, and he suffered much also in war, till he should build his own town and bring his gods to Latium, whence in time the Latin race, the Alban fathers rose, and the great walls of everlasting Rome. Help me, O muse, recall the reasons why. Why did the queen of heaven drive a man so known for goodness, for devotion through so many toils and perils? Was there slight, affront, or outrage? Is vindictiveness an attribute of the celestial mind? In the course of his poem, Virgil answers these and other questions by describing the Romans' special place in the universe and their relationship with their gods in ways often similar to what we see in the Pentateuch. Moreover, the, Roman, the Romans are given divine title to both Rome and empire, as well as a special character to make them worthy of it. As commentators Wilkie and Hurt put it, rather than narrating and directly celebrating modern Roman history, which is ultimately his main concern, Virgil chooses to return to the legendary roots of Roman experience nearly a millennium earlier in the wanderings and wars of the Trojans after the fall of their city. In treating the seeds of later Roman history, Roman religious ritual, Roman character traits as having been sown in that era of the dim past, the Aeneid envisions time and history as a meaningful linear mo mo movement towards goals ordained by a mysterious but pur purposeful providence. Wilkie and Hurt conclude, the Aeneid is then a eulogy about Roman values, but it also puts those values in perspective by showing insistently the great cost at which they are achieved and sustained. In particular, that public duty requires again and again the sacrifice of personal fulfillment, a lesson not likely to be lost on Roman citizens and subjects. One final example a little closer to home will finish our preparation to look at the American works, or rather, a small set of examples for the story I have in mind is that which goes by the name of social contract theory, and which appears in several variations associated with Hobbes, Locke, and Rousseau. The basic plot of the social contract story is that once upon a time, humans lived in a state of nature in which civil society did not exist. All mature individuals were laws unto themselves who made their way in the world as best they could. Although different stories attribute different characteristics to, different characteristics to the state of nature, they agree in that they tell of a time when the state of nature could no longer endure, when humans decided that there was some good to be achieved by banding together. In Rousseau's version, men reached a point where the obstacles to their preservation in a state of nature prove greater than the strength that each man has to preserve himself in that state. Beyond this point, the primitive condition cannot endure, for then the human race will perish if it does not change its modes of existence. Since men cannot create new forces, but merely combine and control those which already exist, the only way in which they can preserve themselves is by uniting their separate powers in a combination strong enough to overcome any resistance, uniting them so that their powers are directed by a single motive and in concert. Here was the birth of civil society, whose legitimacy was bound to the consent of the governed as expressed in the social contract, and whose characteristics were deducible from first principles. Note that the social contract story has many of the characteristics of the Sioux or Israelite or Roman origin myths. 
It describes how society came to be, legitimates a particular type of social structure, and has implications for how people ought to behave. For it describes what could le legitimately be expected of and denied to citizens, and what they in turn could legitimately expect from and deny to their governments. It differs from these more traditional myths in two important ways, however. First, it was an origin myth for a society that did not yet really fully exist. Rather, this myth was spawned to fill a gap left by the demise of the medieval world and to help launch the modern one. As Rousseau says at the beginning of his treatise, his purpose is to consider if, in political society, there can be any legitimate and sure principles of government, taking men as they are and laws as they might be. Second, unlike the Sioux or Israelite or Roman ones, this myth takes the form of a work of philosophy rather than of religion or of literature. But it had to be so, for the world it was trying to build was a rational one, which thus had to have rational foundations. To repeat the point I made before, the bottom line of all this is that these examples are stories, uh, it, excuse me, to repeat the point I made before, the bottom line of all these examples is that stories such as these are not cultural luxuries, but cultural necessities. They are cultural magnets which orient their respective iron filings to lead the particular lives they do. In other words, there could never have been Sioux people without Sioux origin myths. There could never have been Israelites without a Pentateuch. There could never have been a later Rome without an Aeneid. There could never have been a French Revolution without a social contract theory. Similarly, there could not and there cannot be an America without myths of America's origins, to which I will now finally turn. Why is the United States here? Why does it have the form of government that it does? What is its relationship with other countries in the world? How should Americans behave? Unlike the Sioux or the Israelites, Americans do not have a single integrated story to answer these questions for them. Indeed, unlike the Romans, we do not even have a single authoritative epic that describes our cultural core. Rather, like most peoples, Americans make do with a hodgepodge of mythical fragments, which individually do a piece of the work and collectively do it all. In the time that remains then, I would like to take a brief look at five patches of our mythical crazy quilt three political and two literary. As with the myths we have already looked at, I want to emphasize how they establish certain relationships between the past and the present, both the present of when they were written and the present of today, and how they establish relationships between what is and what ought to be. In other words, I want to emphasize how they have and do function as cultural magnets to orient us to a particular American way of life. I'd like to start with the Declaration of Independence, a document self-evidently concerned with explaining and legitimizing the origin of America. In its form, the Declaration consists of a prologue followed by a theorem-like resolution in which the rationale for American independence is proved and then asserted. In its content, the Declaration is a summary of social contract theory in general, followed by its application to the American colonial situation in particular. Collectively, it amounts to the title deed to America. Let's take a closer look at these parts. The prologue of the Declaration is its first paragraph and reads as follows. When in the course of human events, it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the bands which have connected them with another and to assume among the powers of the earth the separate and equal station to which the laws of nature and of nature's God entitle them, a decent respect to the opinions of mankind require that they should neglect declare the causes which impel them to that separation. Notice two things about the way this paragraph frames its subject matter. First, it addresses itself to mankind at large, which presumably means non-Americans. We're going to tell them what we're doing and why. But this is disingenuous, for no matter how important it was in 1776 that the rest of the world should know what the Americans were doing, it was infinitely more important that the Americans themselves should know and be persuaded to participate. Indeed, even today, the Declaration's greatest function is explaining to Americans why the country was founded. Second, the prologue foreshadows the Declaration's conclusion of separation and presents it as necessary. In other words, the revolution is not to be considered arbitrary or accidental or even simply one possible course of action out of many. Rather, it is doubly inevitable following as it does both the laws of nature 
and of nature's God. And thus the revolution is framed to be justifiable to and supportable by both thinkers and believers. The theorem-like resolution begins, as all theorems do, with a set of axioms, principles that cannot be proven to be, but which are assumed to be true, and which form the foundation of the proof which follows them. Here we find the famous lines which summarize social contract theory in general. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed, and so on. The Declaration then goes on to detail the ways in which the present King of Great Britain has broken the social contract, enabling the American representatives to conclude that these united colonies are, and of right ought to be, free and independent states, able to do all the acts and things which independent states may of right do. Here again, I would like to point out two things. First, notice that empirically speaking, the so-called truths are anything but self-evident. Indeed, the briefest consideration of modern or ancient cultures will show that for much, if not most, of humankind, the reverse is usually true. To the Greek, it was self-evidently true that the Greeks were superior to barbarians, and it would have been preposterous to suggest otherwise. What do you think the Nazis or the Serbs or the Hutu made or make of the unalienable right to life? Similarly, Israelite government was not instituted to secure the rights of the governed, but to ensure that the governed performed their duties toward God. The key word in the first sentence, then, is hold. We hold these truths to be self-evident. Read this way, the Declaration is no longer about truths in the world so much as it is about the people who believe in them. In a very important sense, then, to be American is to find these truths self-evident, and those who do not so hold them cannot really be American. Second, notice how the Declaration places the primary blame on the king as if Great Britain were not a parliamentary democracy. For only by doing so could it appeal to the Democrats' revulsion of tyranny and apply the logic of the social contract. Had the, blame, had the blame been placed on Parliament, it would more likely have seemed to be a case of sour grapes by a losing minority, and thus less effective as a cultural magnet. Only by making the revolution appear necessary and inevitable could the Declaration make the revolution unquestionable and unchallengeable. For to attempt to defy the necessary is the act of a fool. Now let's turn to the Federalist Papers. Written between 1787 and 1788 by Alexander Hamilton, James Madison, and John Jay, the Federalist Papers were published anonymously over the pseudonym Publius, first serially in New York newspapers, and then as collected volumes as part of the effort to win ratification for the proposed Constitution. Yet according to Clinton Rossiter, the Federalists worked only a small influence upon the course of the events during the struggle over ratification. The fame of the Federalists derives not so much from the events of a single decisive year, but from the whole course of American history. It is a sign, as it were, of the prodigious success of the Constitution, which, as it has endured and evolved over the generations, has called attention ever more insistently to the men who, having helped to write it, first explained it. In other words, like the Declaration, a primary function of the Federalist Papers has been to inculcate in succeeding generations of Americans a particular view of their national condition. The text of the Federalist opens this way. After an unequivocal experience of the inefficiency of the subsisting federal government, you are called upon to deliberate on a new constitution for the United States of America. The subject speaks of its own importance, comprehending in its consequences nothing less than the existence of the Union, the safety and welfare of the parts of which it is composed, the fate of an empire, in many respects the most interesting in the world. It has been frequently remarked that it seems to have been reserved to the people of this country, by their conduct and example, to decide the important question whether societies of men are really capable or not of establishing good government from reflection and choice, or whether they are forever destined to depend for their political constitution on accident and force. If there be any truth in the remark, the crisis at which we are arrived may with propriety be regarded as the era in which that decision is to be made. And a wrong election on the part we shall act may, in this view, 
deserve to be considered as the general misfortune of mankind. Once again, I'd like you to notice two things. First, that the United States is characterized as an empire. This is but one of many subtle and not so subtle allusions to Rome, an earlier empire that was once the most interesting in the world. Another allusion was the use of the pseudonym Publius itself, the name of a mythical figure who ousted the last Roman king and established the Roman Republic, which appeared at the bottom of every essay. Other references and allusions to Rome occur in the text itself. The combined effect, therefore, would be to suggest that America was in a position to take on the mantle of Roman greatness if only she adopted the same republican form of government which the Constitution provides. Indeed, this identification with Rome has become so strong that today we worry about whether the United States will now suffer a similar decline and fall. Thus, just as Virgil had linked Rome to Troy, Hamilton linked America to Rome. Second, note how the fate of America is intimately tied to the fate of mankind in general, and thus to the fate of the world. In particular, how America is implicitly presented as the pinnacle of human achievement. If Americans cannot establish good government through reflection and choice, then no one can, and this would be a sad fact for mankind. Thus, like the Israelites, the Americans are a kind of priestly nation with a cosmic destiny to lead the world. Such a portrayal is also seen elsewhere in the text. For example, after a discussion about the tremendous difficulties faced by the Constitutional Convention, Madison argues in number 37 that whatever the defect that whatever defects the Constitution may have, the document must ultimately be seen as half full rather than half empty. He writes, The real wonder is that so many difficulties should have been surmounted, and surmounted with a unanimity almost as unprecedented as it must have been unexpected. It is impossible for any man of candor to reflect on this circumstance without partaking of the astonishment. It is impossible for the man of pious reflection not to perceive in it a finger of that almighty hand which has been so frequently and signally extended to our relief in the critical stages of our revolution. It seems that George Mitchell was wrong when he told Oliver North that God didn't take sides in American politics. Or was he? For from where we stand now, 200 years later, having God on the side of the Constitution is simply having God on the side of America as a whole, just where the Declaration put him and just where, any origin, just where any origin myth worth its salt would put him. In short, by linking American government to Rome and God, the Federalist Papers implicitly suggest that it is worthy of respect, awe, and deference, which all Americans will willingly grant it. The bulk of the Federalist Papers, of course, consists largely of a rational defense of the Constitution. To the extent this succeeds, it follows in the Enlightenment tradition of justification through reason. Indeed, to the extent that the ratification of the Constitution itself amounts to a making of a social contract, it represents one of the first actual instantiations of social contract theory. In other words, the United States became what its origin myth said it should be. And as Hamilton noted in the final paper, the establishment of a Constitution in a time of profound peace by the voluntary consent of the whole people is a prodigy. Of all the American origin myths, perhaps none, none comes closer to a traditional origin myth in its explicit linking of past and present and of the way things are and the way things ought to be than Lincoln's Gettysburg Address. First, Lincoln gives us the past. Four score and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth on this continent a new nation, conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. Then he gives us the present. Now we are engaged in a great civil war, testing whether that nation or any nation so conceived and so dedicated can long endure. Next, Lincoln describes what is happening at the moment of his speaking. We are met on a great battlefield of that war. We have come to dedicate a portion of that field as a final resting place for those who here gave their lives that that nation might live. It is altogether fitting and proper that we should do so. Finally, in the third paragraph, which constitutes roughly half the text, Lincoln tells us what ought to be and why. But in a larger sense, we cannot dedicate, we cannot consecrate, we cannot hallow this ground. The brave men, living and dead, who struggled here have consecrated it, far above our poor power to add or detract. The world will little note nor long remember what we say here, 
but it can never forget what they did here. It is for us, the living, rather, to be dedicated here to the unfinished work with they, which they who fought here have thus so far nobly advanced. It is rather for us to be here dedicated to the great task remaining before us, that from these honored dead we take increased devotion to that cause for which they gave the last full measure of devotion, that we here highly resolve that these dead shall not have died in vain, that this nation, under God, shall have a new birth of freedom, and that government of the people, by the people, for the people, shall not perish from the earth. Picking up on the theme laid out in the Federalist Papers, Lincoln highlights the special place of Americans among humankind. Our civil war is not just a test of the viability of the American nation, but of the viability of any nation so conceived and so dedicated. Once again, if Americans can't do it, no one can. Indeed, if Americans fail, government of the people, by the people, for the people, will perish from the earth. Yet as hard as it is for us to see today, the Gettysburg Address is much more than a telling of an existing American origin myth. Rather, as Gary Wills argues, in these 272 words, Lincoln created a new origin myth for America, which changed both how Americans viewed their past and strove for their future. To see this, recall that, technically speaking, Lincoln's job as president was to defend the Constitution and the union it cemented, and that the Constitution nowhere mentions the word equality, let alone anything about a dedication to the proposition that all men are created equal. Quite the contrary, for the preamble of the Constitution explicitly states what that document is dedicated to. Union, justice, domestic tranquility, common defense, general welfare, and the blessings of liberty. None of which, by the way, is mentioned in the Gettysburg Address. What Lincoln did at Gettysburg was an end run around the letter of the Constitution in order to infuse it with the spirit of the Declaration of Independence. In so doing, as Wills puts it, he not only presented the Declaration of Independence in a new light as a matter of founding law, but put its central proposition, equality, in a newly favored position as a principle of the Constitution. Only once this was done did the President's defense of the Constitution amount to a dedication to the proposition that all men are created equal. In short, only by characterizing the Founding Fathers as dedicated to a proposition could Lincoln legitimately present himself as dedicated to a proposition and thus create a country in which we are all now supposed to be dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. Similarly, Lincoln for the first time authoritatively portrayed Americans as a single nation, which preceded the states in time and importance, and thus which by definition was and is indivisible. Wills writes that in Lincoln's vision, America was a people, accepting as its great assignment what was addressed in the Declaration. This people was conceived in 1776, was brought forth as an entity whose birth was datable, four score and seven years before, and placeable on this continent, and was capable of receiving a new birth of freedom. Wills continues, the results were seen almost at once. Up to the Civil War, the phrase the United States was invariably a plural noun, as in the United States are a free country. After Gettysburg, it became singular, as in the United States is a free country. This was a result of the whole mode of thinking that Lincoln expressed in his acts as well as his words, making union not a mystical hope, but a constitutional reality. In short, in the Gettysburg Address, Lincoln implicitly refounded the United States without telling anyone he was doing it, giving us a kind of second republic, or a third republic if you count the Articles of Confederation. Thus, Lincoln became a father of his country, as Washington was, and thus it is not accidental that both men are celebrated on President's Day. Moreover, the Gettysburg Address became a focal point in America's origin myths, for to quote Wills one last time, Lincoln had revolutionized the revolution, giving people a new past to live with that would change their future indefinitely. Thus, the Gettysburg Address has become an authoritative expression of the American spirit, as authoritative as the Declaration itself, and perhaps even more influential, since it determines how we read the Declaration. For most people now, the Declaration means what Lincoln told us it means, as he did to correct the Constitution without overthrowing it. By accepting the Gettysburg Address and its concept of a single people dedicated to a proposition, we have been changed. Because of it, we live in a different America.
instruments. Many of them take the form of works of literature or popular culture. Consider the case of Hawthorne's Scarlet Letter, which the title page presents to us simply as a romance. Once again, we find a text which explicitly juxtaposes elements of our national past and present for the purpose of telling us how we are and how we ought to be. Unlike the examples we have looked at so far, however, with the Scarlet Letter, Hawthorne deals with elements of our national character and negative ones at that. As a historical novel, The Scarlet Letter is an interesting blend of fact and fiction. The book begins with an autobiographical sketch called The Custom House, in which Hawthorne makes a range of observations about Salem, Massachusetts, and the custom house there, where he was employed from 1846 to 1849. This much is fact. In the same sketch, however, Hawthorne tells us how he came upon the tattered remnants of The Scarlet Letter, along with some notes about the story of Hester Prynne. Hawthorne goes on to maintain, therefore, that he is really merely the editor of the story and not its author, for, quote, the main facts of that story are authorized and authenticated by the document of Mr. Surveyor Pugh, close quote. This much is fiction. Yet Hawthorne coyly writes that, I must not be understood as affirming that, in the dressing up of the tale and imagining the motives and modes of passion that influence the characters who figure in it, I have invariably confined myself within the limits of the old surveyor's half a dozen sheets of foolscap. On the contrary, I have allowed myself as to such points, nearly or altogether, as much license as if the facts had been entirely of my own invention. What I contend for is the authenticity of the outline. The last sentence is key, for it is the outline of a scarlet letter that acts as a cultural magnet, and it is this that Hawthorne explicitly claims to be true. The story of the Scarlet Letter proper is also an interesting blend of fact and fiction. For instance, many of the supporting characters, such as Governor Winthrop, Richard Bellingham, Anne Hutchinson, and Anne Hibbins, were real people, and many of the details of early Boston are accurate. Indeed, the primary fictions are in the persons of Hester Prynne, Arthur Dimsdale, Roger Chillingworth, and Pearl, and in the particular episode of the Scarlet Letter, which Hawthorne puts in the seven years from 1642 to 1649. 1649. Note, by the way, that Hawthorne thus positions himself as writing on the bicentenary of the end of the story. In other words, his leaving the Salem Custom House comes 200 years after Dimsdale's demise and Hester's leaving Boston with Pearl. But if the details of the episode of The Scarlet Letter are not true, what are the outlines of the, of the story from which we should draw our lessons? Commenting on Dimsdale's fate, Hawthorne offers us one explicitly when he writes, among the many morals which pre press upon us from the poor minister's miserable experience, we put only this into a sentence. Be true, be true, be true. Show freely to the world, if not your worst, yet some trait whereby the worst may be inferred. But this is not the lesson of an origin myth, but rather of a tragedy whose import is universal. To find the lessons that the Scarlet Letter holds for Americans in particular, we must look elsewhere. For example, in his description of the New England holiday, during which Dimsdale is revealed, Hawthorne says, It may not be too much to affirm on the whole that they, the Bostonians of the day, would f compare favorably in point of holiday keeping with their descendants, even at so long an interval as ourselves. Their immediate posterity, the generation next to the early emigrants, wore the blackest shade of Puritanism, excuse me, wore the blackest shade of Puritanism, and so darkened the national visage with it that all the subsequent years have not sufficed to clear it up. We have yet to learn the forgotten art of gaiety. Or in describing Hester's later years, Hawthorne says that Hester comforted and counseled them, these are women who had been wounded by passion, as, mes as best she might. She assured them, too, of her firm belief that at some brighter period, when the world should have grown ripe for it, in heaven's own time, a new truth would be revealed in order to establish the whole relation between man and woman on a surer ground of mutual happiness. And here is the is and ought of the American character. Americans do not know how to be gay, and we ought to establish a surer ground for happiness between men and women. At least that was the message Hawthorne had for his contemporaries. Whether modern Americans are subject to the same defects is another question. In short, by juxtaposing fact and fiction, 
Hawthorne was not only able to use fact to lend, lend credibility to fiction, but he was also able to use fiction to comment on fact. And in terms of origin myths, this is by far the more important movement, for it takes our Puritan ancestors, those same folk venerated on Thanksgiving, down a peg or two. Don't be like your ancestors, Hawthorne is saying in a work of heresy. Indeed, we can use this insight to answer one of Hawthorne's most wry questions posed following Dimsdale's revelation. Hawthorne writes, the sainted minister in the church, the woman of the scarlet letter in the marketplace, what, imagine would, what imagination would have been irreverent enough to surmise that the same scorching stigma was on them both? The answer, of course, is that the imagination irreverent enough was Hawthorne's. That's whose. Finally, let me just mention the ride of Paul Revere. I don't have too much to say on this score, except to direct your attention to a recent book on the subject by David Fisher entitled Paul Revere's Ride. Although this work is primary, primarily directed at giving a historically accurate account of the now famous ride, along the way, Fisher gives us a fascinating outline of how the ride has been viewed at different periods in American history. In a section entitled Historiography, Myths After the Midnight Ride, Fisher summarizes 11 different perspectives on who Paul Revere was and what he did, each with its own moral implications. The story of Paul Revere we are familiar with by way of Longfellow's poem is merely one of these, albeit the most famous one. In a sense, according to Fisher, Paul Revere's story has served as a, a national Rorschach onto which different, different generations of Americans have projected whatever was of most concern to them. And thus we are given 11 different ways of imitating or rejecting a founding figure in our history. Or in the terms I've been using today, his story is a plastic origin myth enabling each generation to establish a different relation with the same past and thus able to draw different lessons out of it. Let me conclude by way of summary then. I have tried to argue three basic points. First, that because of our biological plasticity, culture in general and certain types of stories in particular are essential components of our lives rather than luxurious frills. That we are iron filings in need of cultural magnets to orient us in the world. Second, that America has such stories which resemble both in form and function those told by other peoples. And third, and finally, I have tried to argue that origin myths, stories about where people come from, where a people come from, its place in the world, and its essential characteristics are an especially important case of such stories. For although I would not go so far as Orwell in saying that he who controls the past controls the future, I would say that he who shapes the past shapes the future. And I hope I have shown you some ways in which our own past and our own future have been shaped. Thank you.